Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. Uh, we have gathered together here because the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of the brethren. And so as we assemble, we assemble in spirit and in truth to seek what God has to say for us today. That there is a word that will facilitate transformation. There is a word that will help us to stand firm in the faith and to resist the seductions and the allurements of a fallen world. It is to the extent that you and I are rightly connected to that word. It's to the extent that you and I can stand firm in the faith. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Eternal God, we are grateful this morning that you've called us into this relationship and made us joint heirs with Jesus with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You said in your word that we are trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. As we explore these scriptures together, we pray that you would open our eyes and open our ears that we may see and hear what thus saith the Lord and what the Lord is doing so that we may rightly connect with the action and activity of the kingdom of God to advance the purpose of God both in our lives and in the world in which we live. Lord, we pray that you would expand our understanding, expand our wisdom, expand our knowledge of you so that we can walk in a manner that is worthy of this call that is on our lives. We ask this in the name that is above all of the names, the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our Lord. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. Uh, we want to continue in our study of theology proper, and as we look at the study of who God is, we are now moving in the area of soteriology. Last week we defined soteriology as being delivered or salvation. Soteriology is the teaching of salvation. Salvation, the word salvation, salvation soteria, means deliverance. God delivered us from something in order to bring us into something. He delivered us out of darkness and sin to bring us into the light of his purpose and to save us from the wrath that is to come. You and I are the recipients of God's work at the cross. What was achieved at the cross was our deliverance. We have been delivered from the bondage of sin. When we fell, when Adam, who was our federal head, fell, all of us fell into sin. And the mark of sin is on all of us. We have a sin nature. But in the cross, hallelujah, God delivered us from that bondage. And the bondage of sin has been lifted from those who believe. Those who believe. Those who have been predestined to be a part of the family of God. Chosen by God to be a part of the family of God. And it is through God's selection of us that we have been regenerated and that regeneration is the new birth, which gives us the capacity to hear the voice of God. Before that, we can't hear him. And we don't have the ability to respond to him. For we are slaves to sin. And being a slave to sin means that he is the slave. Uh, sin is our master. And we listen to him and we do what it says to do. And it does, it takes away our desire to even hear from God. But when God rebirths in us through regeneration, we have a new capacity now to hear. And we believe. Salvation is what? Belief in the finished work of Christ, his call, his deity, who he is, which sets us free in the name of Jesus. So we want to study soteriology. There's three things I want to look at today. The scope of soteriology, the importance of soteriology, and the divine motivation of soteriology. The scope. When we say the scope, we're talking about the aim or the purpose of soteriology. Salvation, the doctrine of deliverance. Soteriology is the application of the work of Christ. This is the scope. It's the work of Christ. The person and the work of Christ to believer. What he has done for you and I. The work of Christ in delivering us from the bondage of sin. And removing from us the stigma of sin. And making us joint heirs with himself. 
Before that, we are alienated and separated from God. Understand that spiritual death means that we are separated from God. God is life. In him was life, and the life was the light of the world. That's what John 1 says. And he brings us back to life. Remember what it says in Ephesians? But God, being rich in his love, made us alive together with Christ. The operative word there is the verb M-A-D. E. Made. That is the work of God in salvation is unique and specifically his. You don't have a role. It's God. He made us alive in Christ Jesus. God did that. It's his work. And so soteriology is the application, underscore the word in your mind, application is the application of the work of Christ, the person and his work to all believers. We are dealing with the application of what God has done through Christ to believers. When we talk about soteriology, we're looking at what God has done through Christ for us what he's done for us when I look at the doctrine of election and we're going to cover that in a few weeks the doctrine of election the doctrine of election means that once we have sinned the consequence of sin rests on all of us for the wages of sin is death death that condemnation is on all men who are apart from God. They're in death. They're not waiting to die. They're in death. Notice what he said to Adam. The moment you eat from that tree, you will surely die. And so the consequence is there, men and women. I want you to hear me on this. It's there already. And so God justifiably can send all of us to hell. And that's what people don't seem to understand. Is God, is God fair by only picking out some and leaving some? No, he, it, he, it's not an issue or question of fairness. It's a question of justice. God is justified in sending all of us to hell. But out of his desire... For glory, he has determined to save some of us. That's his sovereign choice. He didn't have to do it. Am I right about it? He didn't have to do it, but he did it. He chose us. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. No one can because we are spiritually dead. What do you get from a dead man? Nothing can't get anything from a dead man that's why Jesus said to Nicodemus you unless he used the word unless and that word unless speaks to a a necessary condition keep that in your mind unless you are born again you can't enter into the kingdom of God unless a necessary condition some of you are getting that a necessary meaning that there's no entry into the kingdom unless you are born again. And you cannot be born again of, an, of your own self, of and of your, uh, by yourself. You can't do that. It's not, it's not possible for you to do that. That's why regeneration takes place. Notice the word regeneration. Regeneration. To be regenerated means that you were generated at one time through Adam but God regenerates us through the rebirth and in the rebirth our will is brought from underneath Satan and sin and brought underneath God but that only happens because God did it God made us alive so soteriology speaks to the work of God to redeem those to whom he chose in the councils of eternity. In the councils of eternity. R.C. Sproul, in his book called Chosen, has a chapter that's called Double Predestination. 
double predestination, which is an interesting idea that predestination not only saves some of us, but predestination also relegates some to condemnation. He calls that double predestination. So if you're saving some, automatically others are destined towards condemnation. And it is here that people struggle. How can God do that? Is that fair? Yes, it is fair because all have sinned and fall short. And the condemnation, the consequences of sin is death and separation from God. But God, looking at our condition, said, I want to save some of them for my glory. He didn't have to do that. But he says, I want to. That's a sovereign choice. Made in spite of the fact that the ones he's saving need to be condemned. He, we were justifiably condemned. Y'all, some of y'all getting that. Justifiably. But his mercy says, well, let me save a few. The rest of them suffer the consequences of their bad choice. But I'll save a few. Not because they're worthy. Not because they have merit. Not because they were special. Because I want to. I want to. I'm trying to think of an illustration that, that, would, that would work for us. You get to the movie theater. You've been saving your money all week long to go to see this film. And when you get there, it's sold out. And they're turning people away. You get to the window hoping that there's somebody. Is it somebody that maybe didn't show up? Said, no, sir. No. And as they say no and turn you away, the manager shows up. He says, you, come here. So I'm going to let you in. You go sit in my seat. And you can get in. Now, what did you do to earn that? You did nothing to earn that. Why did he choose you? It was his sovereign choice. He just says, you. It could have been anybody, but he said, you, come here. I know it's sold out. Do you really want to see this? Yes. Well, go on and sit in my seat. I've already seen it six times. I'll just stand out here. That's what God did to you. You didn't deserve it. He just said, come on in. And when you come in, you bring him glory. His mercy receives glory. His grace receives glory. And his, the faith that he has deposited in you receives glory. He's doing it for his glory. We're going to cover that in a moment. And so this work of salvation is a work of God that is targeted towards you, not because you deserve it. Not because you deserve it but because he chose you and selected you. He said to his disciples, I chose you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And that's your position today, men and women. A privileged position that God has given to you and it ought to humble you and it ought to change the way you approach your relationship with God. It's not like, hey, what's happening, God? What's going on? It's, God, I'm so grateful for what you've done for me. How can I serve you today? And so the scope of the, of the work of salvation represents that God's applying what Jesus did at the cross for you and I and bringing us out of alienation and separation into a right relationship, a relationship, men and women, listen, that is defined by him and not by you. Hear that today. You don't make this relationship. You don't determine when and how and, and what is right and what is wrong. God makes that determination and not you. That needs to be understood today. There's too many of us want to define our relationship with God. And we abuse grace when I'm under grace. That means I'm, I have a license to do whatever I want because God has given me unmerited favor. No, no, no. That's grace abuse. The next thing I want to look at is the importance 
of soteriology. And there are a number of things I want to look at. Number one, it is important in the salvation of souls. Soteriology, the doctrine or teaching of salvation, is important in the salvation of souls. Knowledge of soteriology is the knowledge of salvation. Knowledge of soteriology is the knowledge of salvation. If God had a plan for salvation, it is plainly of the greatest importance that you and I understand it. It is, it is of the greatest importance that you and I understand what it is so that we don't misrepresent it because we have to represent it. And understanding what it is is absolutely essential to effective communication of what it is. Amen? A lot of people misrepresent it. They say, come down to the altar and surrender and be saved. That's not salvation. Coming to the altar and surrendering is nowhere in Scripture. You'll not find it there. What you'll find in Scripture is if you believe. Believe. What is belief? Trusting. Trusting what? What Christ has done for you at the cross. All is required is for you to believe in the finished work of Christ. The Bible reveals that not only men are interested in salvation, but angels as well, and the prophets of old were interested in salvation. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. When you get to chapter 1, let's look at verse 10 through 12. When you get there, say amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. The Bible reads, And this is salvation. And to this salvation, the prophets who prophesy of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiry. The prophets, they're looking for it. They're trying to understand it. Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven the things into which angels long to look. So what we see here is both angels and prophets were trying to understand it in the Old Testament context. He says that which you are receiving now the prophets were seeking to try to understand and angels look into it trying to understand it too. But you and I have it. You and I are the recipients of it. Amen. We are the beneficiaries of the salvific work accomplished for us at the cross. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Amen. God did that for you. We too must understand salvation. What God has given us through Christ. That's the first thing that is important. The second thing that is important is it is important in evangelism. Understanding soteriology is important in evangelism. From the standpoint of the message of salvation, soteria or soteriology is of the greatest significance. It is linked with the gospel. Men and women, it is the gospel. It is the gospel. The New Testament teaches and affirms that salvation is by the gospel or that through the gospel salvation comes to men. So you and I, we have a responsibility to take that gospel and share it with others. It's important in evangelism for us to understand soteriology. If we are going to bring men to Christ we must understand the doctrine or the teaching of salvation to men, soteriology. The third thing that is important about soteriology, that it is important in the edification of saints. 
It is important in the edification of saints. Now, what does edification mean? Edification is, is the moral instruction of the word of God or the guidance of the word of God for believers. Now, this instruction is especially targeted towards morality or spirituality. The uplift of the body of Christ through the teaching of soteriology is edifying. It edifies us. It matures us. It develops us in our relationship with the kingdom of God and to the advancement of that kingdom as we represent the salvific message of the cross. Soteriology or the doctrine of salvation covers all of the facets of salvation in Christ all of the riches that we have in him it covers it all it covers it all so it's important in evangelism and it is important in edification now let's look at the third area we looked at the scope we looked at the importance of now let's look at the divine motivation for soteriology the divine motivation for soteriology. Here are several reasons which the Bible gives for God's saving work. Number one, first it manifests his glory in his love for men, that he should be glorified in his love for us. Remember I said he saved us for his glory? As he saves us, it demonstrates or displays his love. And his love is exercised in us with one another. And so as we love one another, we give glory to God. Amen? 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 4. I want you to see this. 1 John chapter 4. When you get to chapter 4, look at verse 7 through 14. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Songwriter says, oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved me. I know what love is because I I'm the recipient of the love of Christ. Notice what he says. For love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God's love. He knows love. He knows God. And I want you to know, this here brings a clear bifurcation or distinction between the love that the world represents to us and the love of God. There is, they are not the same. Hello? They are not the same. So love as the world represented doesn't represent at all what we're talking about here. We're talking about the love that comes from God. Love which is what? A agape love wanting the best for the object being love. Whereas love that is expressed through the world is a kind of selfish love. I love you based upon what you can do for me. You know, and I lust for you. It's not I love you, I lust for you. There's a difference. There's a difference. Know that today. We're not talking about the world's definition of love. We're talking about God's. Look what he says. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love God one another no one has seen God at any time if we love one another God abides that word means he stays he's within he abides within us and his love is perfected in us by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because we have given uh, because he has given us 
of his spirit, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So our love displayed to each other becomes a testimony of the love of God which brings him glory. Glory. So we see here that the divine manifestation of God's glory is seen in his love for us. Notice, if you will, Romans chapter 9. No, we better leave that alone. Let's move on. Secondly, the manifestation or the motive for divine soteriology or the doctrine of, of salvation is to bestow on us eternal life. To bestow on us eternal life. We see that in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Eternal life is a manifestation of God's motivation for us. It's a secondary man-oriented motivation, but it is one that God motivated for you and I to have. Thirdly, God saved us that we might do good works. He saved us that we might do good works. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Amen. At 14 it reads, who gave himself to us talking about Christ, to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Zealous for what? Good deeds. He saved us to do good works. You and I have a stewardship responsibility to manifest the fruit of our salvation through what we do in response to the directives of God. Do good works. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. When you get to chapter 2, I want you to look at verses 4, or rather verse 10. The scriptures read, For we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for, let's change that for it in order to, to do, we are created in Christ Jesus for good works in order to walk in them, to perform in them. But the text reads this way, let's go back to the text. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk, live, periapatio, walk, which means to live, that we might live in them, fleshing out the good works of the soteriological relationship that he has made available to us in Christ Jesus from the cross. We are saved to do good works. Now we don't do good works in order to be saved. You hear me on that? You're not working to get saved. You're working on account of the fact that you are saved. So you don't do good works in order to get saved, but you do good works in according to the fact that you are saved. And so we do the fruit of our salvation and how we live out our faith in display and demonstration of our transformation and regeneration, our new birth in Christ. And so, secondly, we said first motivation was that it was a manifestation of God's love which brings him glory. Second, to bestow on us eternal life. We are the recipients of eternal life. Third, that you and I are saved to do good works. 
Not to be saved, but because we're saved, we do good works. Number four, number four, in order that we might offer spiritual sacrifice unto God, that we might offer sacrificially our works unto God. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. And the scriptures read, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We offer up spiritual sacrifices. How do we do that? We offer up the sacrifice of praise. Do you know you are saved to praise him? And so when we have time for praise in our, in, our, in our congregation, when we're lifting up our hands and praising our God, we are offering a sacrifice of praise to him. Not only do we sacrifice with praise, we also sacrifice in our giving. Giving of our time, our talent, and our resources. That's a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of giving that you and I are involved in. And here perhaps is the greatest of all the sacrifices that we offer ourselves as a sacrifice, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. That means everything else is secondary to my relationship with our God. I give you over all. Andre Krause says, all I have and all that I'll ever be, I owe it all to you. He says, I surrender all. I surrender it all to you. All to you, my precious Savior. I surrender it all. The surrender only takes place after salvation, not before salvation. Because you're dead. You can't surrender anything when you're dead. But when you are regenerated, born again, then the sacrifice of yourself becomes a real reality in your life. And so we are saved. And the divine motivation is that we might offer spiritual sacrifice to the Lord. Number five. In order to end, uh, to the end, in order to this end, that we might live with him. That the divine motivation is that he saved us that we might be with him. God wants to have a relationship with you. That's why we call it, do you have a personal relationship with God? An intimate relationship with God that comes through the word of God. That's God's desire. He desires that for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thess chapter 5. When you get to chapter 5, look at verse 10. Who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. We are entering into a relationship with God. Men and women, that's what God has made available for you. A relationship. And it's a subordinate relationship with the master, the king, the lord of all creation. He desires a relationship with you. And that's why you were saved. He wants to have a relationship with us. And we ought to have a relationship with him. Glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what the Westminster a confession says, what is the chief purpose of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Forever. Not just for some time, but forever. Amen. Number six. Number six. God, the divine motivation is to the end that we might show forth his excellences. The excellences of God. First Peter chapter two. 
First Peter chapter two. When you get to chapter two, look at verse nine. First Peter chapter two and verse nine. Amen. And here's the scripture says this. But you are a chosen race. Underscore the word chosen. Chosen race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for God's own possession. So that you might proclaim the what? The excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Chosen and called. God called us, chosen us, that we might show forth the excellences of his grace and of his mercy and of his great love for which he loved us. And then finally, brothers and sisters, the divine motivation of God's saving work in order that God may through us show the exceeding riches of his grace that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace Ephesians chapter 2 Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7 that he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace. Notice. So that in the ages to come, eternity future, in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You are saved to show the exceeding riches of the grace of God not only now but into eternity into eternity it will be a living billboard to those in eternity future of the grace and kindness of God notice that it's now and the ages to come that's why God saved us we are a testimony through the salvation that Christ has offered to all of us who have been chosen and called to be a part of the family of God, a testimony into the ages to come of the riches of the love of God displayed in us. This is salvation. This is soteriology. This is why you and I were saved. And it certainly fits into the purposes of God. It is an expression of the glory and the love and the kindness and the compassion of God. The compassion of God to reach into the darkness of our circumstances and rescue us. He brought us out in order to bring us in. Deuteronomy chapter 6. He brought us out of darkness into the light. This is what has been done for you and I. And this is why you and I celebrate. We praise him. We give him glory and honor. And to the degree that you understand that, it will intensify your worship of God. Amen? See, some people are still on the periphery. They're just in and they're glad they're in. And they don't know they're supposed to give themselves sacrificially to the Lord. They don't know they're supposed to offer up praises and offer up thanksgiving unto the Lord. Giving of their time, talent, and treasure. Giving of themselves sacrificially to the Lord. They don't know that yet. And that's why they're on the periphery. And they're babies. The Bible says solid food is for the mature who through practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. That happens with maturity. Some of us are still on milk. It's my job to bring you up to steak. Amen. Amen. To get you eating some steak and potatoes. And some broccoli. Amen. Something green. You got to throw something green in there. Amen. So that's where we are. That's why we're studying soteriology. 
And you can't study, study soteriology apart from Christology. Christology is the study of Christ and the mission and the purpose and the man of Christ because soteriology comes to us out of Christology, out of what he did and how he did it for us. I like what the songwriter said, what he's done for me, what he's done for me. I can't forget what he's done for me. And you can't tell it like I can tell it. This is my testimony. But you got one too. You got one too. And you need to live it out. You need to live it out. Let somebody see you saved. By the choices you make. And by the resistance that you stand in. Against the darkness of a seductive, tempting world that's constantly tempting us away from God. Remember, we said there's three phases to salvation. We have been saved from the penalty of sin, and we're being saved from the power of sin, and we will be saved from the presence of sin when Jesus comes. Three phases. Three phases. I know I said that. And I, you need to understand that. That's soteriology too. And the being saved, and we went to a number of scriptures that in the King James represent, says, perish, those who, are, who have perished, and those who are saved. But in the Greek, it's in the present tense participle. Being saved from the power of sin. And most of us in here recognize that the power of sin is still operating. Am I right? Get your hands up. Am I right about it? Get your hands up. You, you recognize there's still power, and it still has influence on you. And you need to be delivered from it. And that's what salvation being saved means in your sanctification. That you're learning enough to resist the power. And you will not be in that influence when Jesus comes. But in between now and then, you can wrestle with sin. You can wrestle with it. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That we walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Those things are said in the scripture because the Bible recognized the power is still operating in the earth today. And Satan is going to do everything he can to derail you from your relationship with God. Understand that, people. Yes, we are saved from the penalty of sin, and we will never go under judgment again. But the influence of sin is still operating today. And we got an old nature that wants to raise his head up every now and then. Through pride and arrogance. Right? Or through inferiority and insensitivity and other kinds of uncertainties that happen in our life that produces a fleshly response. God is giving us the capacity to overcome that when we yield to the spirit of God that is within. But you got to know how to do that. And that's what the, the Bible says. He gave some as pastors, teachers for what purpose? To equip the saints that they may do the work of the ministry. And part of that is understanding what salvation has accomplished for you. Amen. Pass under the penalty not to be judged anymore. We come from under the power of sin through the presence of the spirit within us. Right now we're in a present struggle. And then the presence of sin will go away when Jesus comes for he will take it and rid us of sin forever. He'll take that old nature out of us and eradicate it. Eliminate it discard never to influence us again right into eternity forever and ever with Jesus who is our Savior and so we study soteriology we study theology proper we study theology some of you in, in here are becoming theologians I see it right now amen because we're understanding what God has done for us let's pray Father, we thank you so much that we can be students of the word of God. Yes, our emotions are involved in it, but it's not about the emotions. The emotions are responding to truth, to what you have done for us, what you will do for us, and what you are doing in us, and what the word says about it. Help us, Father, to learn, to know, to do all that you have revealed in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thank you for joining us. I trust that you've been challenged to think differently today in light of what God has done for you. God is at work. The outworking of the purposes of God are evident to us within the word. You want to know what God is doing? Open your book. Somebody said this book, the Bible, will keep you from sin and sin will keep you from this book. I would say you have victory over sin in Christ. Open the book. God bless you. See you next Sunday. Church,